Good morning students, welcome to the course on Fundamentals of Cognitive Robotics and today we are going to talk about uh, a very important part of Cognitive Robotics experiment. We are going to talk about EG experiments because in order to uh, you know, know what is there in a human brain from a robotics perspective in order to develop a brain computer interfacing it is absolutely important that we understand how to know what is happening in the human brain that's what we will be discussing today that how to carry out EEG analysis and through that how to know about the state of a human brain. Let us look into that. I have talked about some of the reference books which will be useful now, particularly the first and the third book that is the neuroscience book which is edited by Del Parves and the control systems uh, classical modern and AI based approaches. These are the things which will be important at this stage. So, you can catch hold of uh, these books and you can also try to get reference materials related to the lecture. Now in today's lecture, we will talk about the history of electroencephalography or EEG, a little bit of it. We will also give a kind of an introduction to the EEG analysis, various components or elements of the EEG analysis. Then we will talk about the EEG waveform, EEG results, analysis and interpretation, signal filters that are used in EEGs, how to use you know some of these uh, filters especially for artifacts like eye blink removal and one of the most important thing against external stimulus, how to use the event related potential information. And finally, I would also talk about the advantages and disadvantages of the risks of the EEG. There are various ways in which we can find out the state of a brain. So, EEG is one of the way in which we insert electrodes over the skull of a brain. So, it does not penetrate the body, it remains over the skull of the brain that is one way and then there are other ways for example there are ways uh, which are related to MRI and specifically called fMRI which actually finds out that as the blood flows inside the brain and as this blood uh, is getting oxygenated you can say that somewhat that those are the regions where more oxygen supply is happening, you can say indirectly that nerves are more active in those areas. So, if there are more presence of blood flow, then naturally because blood contains a good amount of uh, iron particle in the form of hemoglobin, so uh, the magnetic resonance uh, you know would be able to catch it and then from that we will be able to get a kind of a pattern that is happening inside. However, these techniques of MRIs and fMRIs, they have a very good special resolution because uh, many parts of the brain what is happening that they can capture, but they do not have a good temporal resolution. That means over time they are actually very slow. On the other hand, EEG is very fast, it can very quickly say what is happening in the brain. So, in fact, today a mixing of the two technologies seems to be a much better way of actually analyzing what is happening in the brain. So, before looking into the EEG, let us first very quickly look into all the other available technologies. Now, there are various methods as I told you for observing the living brain. 
and in terms of time those which are slow will be in the right hand side of it and in terms of time those which are fast they will be in the left hand side say for example EEG and MEG is there in the left hand side because they are very fast phenomena whereas fMRI is relatively slow and the PET uh, technology or other studies of Leyson etc these are very slow. Now, in terms of the size that it covers, because the brain is a large area, so there are actually tests like patch clamp tests which are in the dendrite level, and then a single neuronal unit also can be tested once again by placing the electrodes directly over the neuron. And at a higher level, there are these optical dyes, and of course, when the entire brain is concerned then you can actually make a network of EEGs or MEGs and through that you can actually check it. There are other technologies which are just coming up which is like TMS which is somewhere in between the EEG and fMRI technology. So this actually gives us a global picture that where these EEGs are and we can say that EEGs are a process of analysis which is very fast millisecond level but it works in a global scale on the full brain. So that is something that we have to keep in our mind. Now I will talk about a little bit about the history of EEGs. In 1875, Sir Richard Catton of Liverpool is credited that uh, is the first person to actually apply the EEG technique, the electrical phenomena of the uh, exposed optical lobes of dogs and monkeys. So essentially he had literally opened up the dogs and monkeys brains and then on the optical lobes he has actually inserted the electrode and then he has found out that yes there is an electrical pulse that are associated with it. So later on Sir Adolf Beck he has actually found out that in rabbits and dogs there is this spontaneous electrical activity of the brain that is happening. And even later in 1920, Dr. Hans Berger, in fact, uh, we have the one of the waves of brain waves, alpha wave is named after Berger's wave. And he is credited to be the first person to actually talk about something like an EEG because so far in the first two cases, uh, these two cases, it was actually open brain surgery during that time it was tested. But during Dr. Hans Berger experiments, he was first able to record EEG tracings from the human scalp itself. And he discovered waves at a low frequency like 10 hertz. In fact, alpha waves is what he has looked at. So this is something that actually shows the original wave that he has in fact looked into. And you can see this is an alpha wave which is a very slow paced wave. In fact, he carried out this experiment on his own son showing the alpha activity. So that was the first time you know the EEG uh, is kind of uh, it was uh, proved that EEG can actually pick up some interesting signals from the brain. And later on in 1935, Forrester and Altberger they have used these uh, for intraoperative EEG, which means during surgery, they have used this similar way of taking the signal so that they can monitor the patient's state during surgery. So that is a brief history about the EEG. Now, let us introduce that what is this EEG test all about? Well, EEG test is all about uh, a medical device development for analyzing the electrical activity of the brain. The frequency range is between 0.1 to 100 hertz and the amplitude of the voltage is quite small. It is about 2 to 200 micron volt. The general mechanism by which it works is that it picks up the summative charges of the electric potentials using either passive or active electrodes. Now the difference between the passive and the active electrode is that passive electro electrodes are generally not fitted with any amplifier. 
but because the signals are very low sometimes it actually in microvolt range it makes sense to have an amplifier on the electrode itself so then it becomes actually active electrodes now both passive and active electrodes can be actually divided to further subclasses which are known as dry electrode this will be dry electrode and wet electrode well the difference is in terms of that in case of a wet electrode we actually apply some kind of a silver chloride gel on the brain and then apply these transducers but for dry we do not do it and generally dry electrodes are used for kids who are very you know uh, dynamic uh, so wet actually creates disturbance for them so that you do not get the desired brain picture so that's why dry is generally preferred for such cases but it is not so accurate as the wet electrode now you may remember that i said earlier that the neurons are negative when they are at rest it is something like minus 50 to minus 60 millivolt potential but the moment a neuron is firing it becomes positive and if there are a group of neurons uh, firing then there is a lot of positive charges developing and the EEG record the summation of charges by the electrodes and these signals are transferred from the electrodes to the amplifiers because the signals as I told you is very very small and then their process signals are then shown on the screen sometimes it is recorded also so this is what is the basic way of carrying out the EEG now the source of the EEG if you look at it very carefully you see that there are so many neurons here and this is deep inside the brain and as they are getting charged as you can see here that the active synapses are here then these charges are actually coming and of course on their way they get reduced a lot but they are coming towards the scalp and electrodes are actually going to pick them up so you can see that in between there are so many areas that they have to cover actually and naturally it becomes more and more feeble because here at this level uh, it may be in the millivolt range that we have earlier seen about the neuronal impulse conduction but by the time it reaches here it will be in the microvolt range so so much of charge dissipation takes place so whenever the wave of ions reaches the electrodes on the scalp then they can push or pull electrons on the metal of the electrodes and that's where we get the signal so this push or pull difference is actually measured at voltage across time and that is referred as the EEG signal. So that is what is the source of the EEG signal. Now what are the basic elements of EEG? Well one of the most important thing about doing EEG is to know that where to place these uh, you know electrodes. Okay? So the electrodes how to place and how to make actually uh, pairs of these then that actually will uh, develop uh, or will be defined in terms of the montages. So this actually refers to the placement and mixing of these electrodes that how we are pairing it up. Now the EAG can be monitored with either a bipolar montage or a referential one. So if it is a referential one, generally we take the reference near the ear lobes or if it is a bipolar one, then each one of them will be having its own references. Now bipolar implies two electrodes for one channel. So you have a reference for that channel available for each channel itself. Otherwise you can have a common reference electrode as I told you, which is usually close to the other and small metal discs usually they are made of stainless steel or tin or gold or silver the more expensive you would go for and they are covered with a silver chloride coating they are placed on the scalp in special position and these positions I will soon show you that these positions are referred as 1020 system now each of these electrode positions are labeled with a letter and a number for example you can see here that fp1 
A F seven. Okay. So if uh, and A F that is anterior frontal. Okay. And then only frontals. Okay. Then frontocentral that is F C. Then only central that is C. Some people call this C as Z also. So in some things because in German central is central, so some people refer them as Z also. So C C five C three C one. And centro parietal, parietal, parieto occipital, and temporal. All of them you can see the abbreviations here. Now the other abbreviation is in terms of these numbers you might have noted. Well, the odd numbers would mean that it is in the left side of the brain. So you can see that this side, this is where it's in the left side of the brain. Okay, and the even numbers would say that these are in the right side of the brain. So all these numbers will be right side of the brain. Now the other important point that I will tell you is that keep these points in mind that this is where is the nose, and this is where is the occipital region. There is a tip at the occipital region, and uh, we call it as incision. So these are the two uh, with respect to which we actually spread it. Spreading of neuron is uh, spreading of electrode on the brain is an art on its own. So there is a, a rule that is called ten twenty rule. I am going to explain it to you now, and this rule is made so that uh, at different places of the world, if this EEG test is happening, then there will be a commonality. People will not get confused between the positions. So these are the universal positions, which is common all over the world. So whenever wherever a human scalp is getting tested. They do it with respect to these positions, and then they report the data, and others can easily understand because these are all universal locations. So it is very important for us to understand these universal locations. Let's look into them. As I was telling you earlier, that the first thing before placing the electrodes you have to mark is just above the nose is our nasian part, and behind the brain there is a little lump if you. Uh, check your uh, occipital area behind the brain. That is called inian part. So nasian and inian. So and the line that actually joins them. This is the line that is what is the central line. So this is the central line. Okay. So you have to keep the central line in mind. Okay. And everything is either there are places which are left to the central line. This is left, and this is the right part. And you remember that left all numbers are odd, one, three, sevens, etc., and right all numbers are even. That is one way to know which one is left, which one is right. Now the other thing is that, so with respect to this central line, if I go up to ten percent from the, uh, and this line is also known to us because this goes to the ear lobes. So these two lines are actually known to us beforehand. So that means. I can actually measure this, you know, and 10% of the distance. That is where inside also 10%. We actually place our first series of the electrodes. Okay, so FPJ, FP1, FP2s, etc. After that, next placings are all at 20%, 20%. So whatever is the total length, 20% of each, that's the distance where we place it everywhere else. And again for the inian. Ten percent by the two sides of the inian, left and right, and all other areas are actually all other areas here. These are all twenty percent. So this is the ten percent, twenty percent rule that we follow, and based on that we actually place the electrodes. Now, how many electrodes can we place? Well, we can place as you can see here that very easily we can place in this manner. You 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 can see that there are central. Uh, you know five electrodes, and then here you can see that there are five and three eight, so eight and eight, sixteen electrodes are there. Okay, and center there are five electrodes, and there are others which can go up to thirty-two electrodes EEG machine. There are even other EEG machines which can go up to sixty-four electrodes. So you know uh, there are various ones, but these are the basics that you have to cover, and these are to be placed when I say FP one. The position is fixed. That is, it is 10% from this side and 10% from this side. That is where the FP1 has to be. 
okay and then in between you can add many modes that is not a problem and then you can accordingly you know put this left uh, odd and right even numbering system and uh, the locations also you can number so that is the way we use the 1020 system of electrode placement we will now look into different components of the EG. Now, as I told you that first and the foremost important component of an EEG is actually the amplifier. Why the amplifier is required? Because you need to actually amplify the signal which is initially at micro voltage level to something like a millivolt level so that we can easily analyze it. So, you need an amplifier. But when you will be amplifying, you will be amplifying the noise also. So that is where the role of amplifier is so important that it not only should amplify the signal. Now let us say that this is the original signal and after amplification let us say this amplifies but also it should remove let us say if there are noises here it should remove those noises. Okay? So it should be a noise free so that if there are noises in between those noises should not appear here. So, it has to amplify also keeping in mind the filter of it. Now, it does this by taking energy from a power supply, that is why you need a power supply, controlling the output to match the input signal shape but with a larger amplitude. And human brainwave activity is too subtle to read unless the signal is amplified. This units are available uh, now they can usually connect uh, through a USB port and transmit signals to any therapist computer and older units have a serial interface but now there are much better interfaces available. So in a typical amplifier there can be 32 channels, the sampling rate can be 1024 hertz, bandwidth can be from 0.1 hertz to 400 hertz, of course up to 400 hertz you do not require as I told you that may be up to 200 hertz is good enough and also head stamps with impedance of LEDs. So that is what is the first important component of the EEG. The next important component of the EEG is in terms of the filters. As you can see here that these filters, they use these filters so that the original signal noises you can actually attenuate depending on where you want to do it like in 0 to 55 hertz after filtering you see this attenuated knowledge uh, no, uh, signal and then you can also apply smoothing filters then you can get an even better one and so that is how you can actually apply the filters if you do not do it then the data will be almost unreadable so that is why you need to clean up the raw data so this is also the raw data the first part you need to clean it up by actually applying the filters. So we will talk about the filters. Now uh, the next point of course is after filtering you need to put that output. So earlier days the output used to be using a writing unit uh, and in a painting paper system but today you know it can, so th at that time it was important that what was the speed of the paper mechanism like uh, 30 millimeter per second with at least the additional speeds of 15 and 60 millimeter per second so that you can record the data. If the speed is low, uh, then you will be missing some of the high frequency components. So that is where the speed is important. And today of course, the entire data comes in a digital screen which you can actually record digitally and you can then analyze the data. Now, Whenever we talk about the uh, EEG data, we have to know about the EEG waveforms. And starting from the low frequency to the high frequency, the waveforms that would be coming up will be like delta band, that is what is your delta band here and that is up to 4 hertz. And then you have alpha band that is 8 to 13 hertz which is somewhere here this is what is your alpha band and you can have a theta band in between which is 4 to 8 hertz so this is what is your theta band and then in the same 8 to 13 hertz region or 8 to 12 hertz you can have a mu rhythm also so 
you can have a mu rhythm. Now you can see that both alpha and mu they share uh, the same bandwidth almost 8 to 13 and 8 to 12 but the pattern of mu and the pattern of alpha these two are not the same that's why it's little different and next then you have the beta band that is about 13 to 30 hertz so this is your beta band and finally you have the gamma band that is 30 to 50 hertz so this is about your gamma band so if you look at it very carefully the way it happens is that when you are in a very deep sleep then this is the del de you know this is the delta wave range when you are dreaming or daydreaming you are having episodic memories then it is the theta alpha is when you are simply taking rest you close your eyes alpha waves will be automatically coming up within few you know minutes the brain signal start to show the alpha mu although is similar to alpha but mu is different in terms of that it has it is related to certain activities processes etc beta is when you are fully conscious and in fact thinking of some activity movement then it is beta and gamma is even higher when you are deeply concentrating on some task that is where the gamma will be coming into picture so these are the various gradations of the eeg waveform so for example, here I have also mentioned what I have told you few minutes before that sensory motor mu rhythms 8 to 12 hertz even though they are similar but they are they look different as I told you uh, the mu from the alpha and they are used to recognize intentions or preparations of movement and also some imaginary motor movement this is where the mu rhythm comes into picture. Now beta are associated with actually alertness, arousal, concentration and attention etc. So that is where the beta wave comes into the picture and then we have the gamma band that is the last one that is where is the gamma and uh, this is the beta. So gamma is for mental activities such as perception, problem solving, creativity etc. And as I told you that even though alpha band and mu rhythms cover the same frequency range, however the waves are different and you can clearly see that, that the waves are, uh, these two waves are different in nature. So you can clearly see the differences. Now let's say you want to carry out yourself some EEG test, you have a 16 channel or a 32 channel EEG setup available with you. So the first there is a step by step process to prepare the subject we have to know it in order to get the good quality data so that is what I will be discussing now. So now we will talk about the preparation for EEG and as you can see that first of all you have to take care that the subject must wash his or her hair with shampoo, conditioner is not needed there should be as little oil as possible so that the results will not be tampered and the subject uh, must tell his her health care provider of all medicines prescriptions and supplements that they are taking the important thing is that the su subject should not have sugar and if there is sugar etc then there has to be some precautions that are to be taken the subject must discontinue using medicines particularly if the subject is taking some neuro uh, medicines then they are to be discontinued because otherwise that may interfere with the test. So, if the healthcare provider has directed then this is to be done. And then also another important thing the subject must avoid consuming any food or drinks containing caffeine for 8 to 12 hours before the test because caffeine has some neurotransmitters that can affect the normal neuronal activity. If the subject is having a sleep EEG sometimes we take the sleep EEGs he or she may be asked to stay awake the night before so that you can get a deep sleep and through that you can capture maybe the delta waves. And of course the subject must avoid fasting the night before or the day of the procedure. Why? Because then there will be low blood sugar and that may also influence the results. So you need to avoid the low blood sugar as well. So these are the basic preparations that you have to take. Next is what we will be doing during the EEG procedure. So as you can see here 
that there is a cap and this cap is having uh, it has actually taken care of the 10 percent 20 percent more or less by these places where the electrodes are placed. So, a standard such EEG uh, experiment will take about an hour you have to keep in mind and the subject will be positioned on a padded bed or chair you can do either way to measure the electrical activity in various parts of the brain there has to be a nurse or EEG technician who will attach 16 or 20 electrodes that is why these electrodes are. So, 16 or 20 electrodes to the skull the brain generates electrical impulses that these electrodes will pick up and to improve the conduction of these impulses to the electrodes a gel usually we use a gel of argent uh, term chloride AgCl gel that is what is used uh, generally between this electrode and the skull each electrode and the skull and the electrodes gather the impulses given up by the brain and it do not transmit any stimulus to the brain that is to be understood that is to be told many times for the kids that is to be told to their parents that uh, EEG is only a sensor it is not going to put any signal to the brain it only picks up the signals whatever is available outside the brain and the technician may tell the subject to breathe slowly or quickly uh, and may use some visual stimuli such as flashing light to see what happens in the brain when the patient sees these things and the brain's electrical activity is all throughout recorded through the EEG testing. So, that is the way the test is carried out. Now, after the EEG procedure, after the test is complete, then of course you are removing these electrodes so you need to remove nothing is remaining on the body the subject is generally instructed to resume any meditation by the medical caregiver and the subject will be ready to go home immediately generally following the test and no recovery time is required for this so that is what is after the eeg procedure very simple now, here I am talking about some of the typical EEG results that you will get and you can see that when you are directly getting through from the channel how complicated looking they are and in fact in some cases if there is a scissor kind of a thing then you may see this kind of you know activities that will say that there is something like a scissor happen otherwise it will be like a very complex uh, noise you know. Uh, trail or a signal with a low signal to noise ratio. Now, each area of the brain will produce a different brainwave strip as you can see here every channel has a different strip in it and when examining the recordings neurologist looks for certain patterns that represent the problems in particular areas of the brain because these are all channels and you know which channel corresponds to which area of the brain. And the results are compared against a normal brain which has a specific brain wave pattern. So, that is the way we actually work on the EEG results. At this stage, it is absolutely important to use the filters in order to make the results of any sense. So, without filters, many segments of EEG would be actually unreadable. Now, EEG filters are not only used to remove noise but also involuntary body movements during taking EEG we blink many a times. So, these blinkings are to be also filtered out. So, this is also needed to be done. And the three common filters that we are using in such cases are low frequency filter or also known as high pass filter, high frequency filter also known as low pass filter and notch filter. So, these are the three that we will be using. We will now talk about that what are these three different sensors, what is the constitutive relationship and how they are useful in each of the areas of EEG analysis. Let us look into that. So, the first uh, filter that we have talked about is a low pass filter. That means a filter which actually passes signals with a frequency that is lower than a selected cutoff. It allows those low things and the higher frequencies are actually filtered. 
Now the way it is done is by using a RC circuit as you can see that there is an RC circuit that is used and the output voltage with respect to the input voltage here can be simply written by Karsov's law as V out as V in minus RC dV out dt where V in t is a step function of magnitude V i that is the input voltage and output is coming out of the you know signal uh, filter or conditioner. Now this V out t can be written in terms of the input as something like 1 minus e to the power minus uh, omega t you know that is common for a RC circuit and where this omega 0 is actually this RC circuit and the cutoff frequency if we try to uh, use it in terms of the corner frequency or cutoff frequency then this omega 0 is uh, which is in red per second you have to divide it by 2 pi then you will be getting uh, that Fc. Now you can actually apply a Laplace transformation to this signal and then you, what you will get as a transfer function is an algebraic relationship between V out and V in okay and that will be a first order filter like omega 0 divided by S plus omega 0. Now because this polynomial is a first order S to the power 1 so that is why this is also called as a first order filter and the response of the first order filter is usually in terms of this kind of a direct cutoff as you can see. So it is these are the pass bands by varying omega c or the varying rc you can actually define the bandwidth up to which signal you will be passing and the same thing is true for the phase also that up to which point the phases are to be retained. So that is the fast low pass filter. We will then talk about what we call a high pass filter and that means it will be uh, you know for the low frequency part will be actually filtered. So it will be allowing the frequencies higher than a certain cutoff frequency. Now why this is required as I told you that suppose I want to see uh, a low wave something like a delta wave or an alpha wave, then what I will do? I will go for a low pass filter. But suppose I want to see something like a beta wave or something like a gamma wave, then what I can do is that I can cut off this alpha wave or delta waves and that is where the high pass filter will come into picture. And as you can see here that this is where the C and R are in actually series unlike the last case. And here the transfer function will then become there will be a 0 in the transfer function in the numerator and denominator is the same. So as a result of this the way in which it is filtering is just the other way around that means up till this point the gain is very low. So it will not allow the signal to come and beyond this point then the signals are actually coming that is where is the pass band of the signal. And as I told you that this cutoff frequency Fc is actually 1 by 2 pi rc that is 1 over rc is omega 0 so it is omega 0 by 2 pi. So that is what is an high pass filter. The phase is just the reverse in this case as you can see that initially there is a phase and as the cutoff frequency is crossing then the phase is actually getting filtered. So that is the way the high pass filter is going to work. Now you can have a combination of a high pass and a low pass. In that case what we will need is something which is called a band pass filter. So that means some part of the signal initially is cut and some part of the signal beyond a point is stopped and the pass band is somewhere in between. So that can be also a frequency response and this is known as a band pass filter. So essentially it will be as you can see this it will be a combination of some sort of a low pass and a high pass filter. So that is what is the band pass filter as you can see that the phase here is also during the uh, pass band it is actually changing the nature from positive to negative plus 90 to minus 90 the phase changes its nature. So that is what is a band pass filter. Well low pass filter, high pass filter or band pass filter 
they are put when you are actually chopping out some part of the EEG response and you are only looking at a particular band of the EEG response. But as I told you that let us say at this moment itself you can see that my eyes are blinking and if there is an electrode it is going to get that signal immediately and there will be a sharp peak there and many times that actually camouflages the actual signal. So we need to filter that in such cases, we will be using actually something called a notch filter. So let us look into a notch filter. So here we are talking about a notch filter. Now what does this notch do? As you can see the name itself is telling that it is actually notching under a certain band. It is not allowing any wave to pass. And these notch filters are actually second order. So, so far we had first order filters, but here these are second order filters. And you can see that they are having two zeros and also they are going to have two poles. So usually, uh, in you know, if we uh, draw the real versus the imaginary of X uh, for such filters. So let us say real S versus the imaginary of S. Then it is going to have there are zeros there which will be in a high frequency range and followed by some poles which will be far away from the real axis. So this is what these are the poles P1, P1 and P2. So these poles are nothing but the roots of the denominator. So this is this denominator is going to produce these poles. And the numerator which is also a quadratic polynomial is going to produce these zeros. So this is where you know is typically a notch filter. So this is what is the amplitude and this is what is the phase that you can see that the phase shifts from 0 to you know uh, minus 90 to plus 90 and then it comes back to 0. That is what is the notch filter's phase characteristics. So these are the amplitude and the phase characteristics of a notch filter. Now the type of artifacts that I was just mentioning, I blink is just one of the artifacts. There are many different types of artifacts which can be originated due to environment noise, experimental error or some physiological artifact like the eye blink itself. Now environment artifacts and experimental errors and environment artifacts, they actually come from external factors, they are extrinsic, whereas the physiological form will be from eye blink, from muscle activity, from heartbeat, they are actually intrinsic artifacts. So the environment artifacts can be eliminated by filters if you know what is the environmental characteristics. But physiological artifacts are generally more difficult to be removed. Of course you can use as I told you the notch filters, but they are generally difficult because notch filters are generally for a specific filter uh, frequency. So if you have a specific peak at a particular frequency, a notch here can work. But what if this frequency changes its position? What if the heartbeat changes? Then this is not effective. So in such a case, you need a little more involved type of an artifact removal algorithm. So one of the algorithms that we use in such a case is called KSVD algorithm, which is particularly used for eye blink artifact removal. As you can see here that all the data in the 14 channels of a subject and you, you can clearly see the eye blinks, you can clearly see and if you use a KSVD which essentially works on a dictionary learning, it first learns this frequency, nature of frequency of this and then you know it creates a dictionary for sparse representation uh, using a singular value decomposition approach. And then this case VD uh, actually is based on a K means of a clustering method that works uh, iteratively on each one of these signals and make a best fit and then it gives the filtered data. So this is what becomes the filtered data where these entire artifacts are absent. So this needs some algorithms to work. Now luckily most of the EEG uh, comes with software and these softwares will be definitely having KSVD as one of the popular option which can take care of this. But you need to know that this kind of a filtering 
needs to be applied for things like IV link removal. So far, we have discussed about the ambient signal that is anytime if you place an EEG on the brain, what are the signals that will be coming out and how you can take out the artifacts, noises, etc. from it. Now we will look into that if you give a specific stimulus to the brain, let's say you give me a task to actually play a game or to count a number or semi such any such tasks, then actually the external stimulus comes into picture and then there is something called event related potential that we can measure from this signal. That's what we will be discussing now. So now we will be talking about event related potentials or in short ERPs. These are small voltages that is generated in the brain structures when you are subjecting it to specific events or stimuli. Now EEG changes that are time locked to sensory motor or cognitive events that provide non-invasive approach to study these uh, psychophysiological correlates. This is where the ERP is actually very important. So it essentially reflects the summed activity of postsynaptic potentials produced when large number of similarly oriented cortical pyramidal neurons in the order of some thousands or millions of neurons will fire in synchrony while processing the information. And this ERPs can be divided into two categories, early waves, components speaking roughly within the first 100 milliseconds and uh, they are termed as sensory or exogenous as they depend largely on the physical parameters of the stimulus and then the cognitive or endogenous ones which is after 100 millisecond or 200 millisecond as the subject evaluates the stimulus then the reflection of that comes in the form of cognitive or endogenous signals. So you see both of them are important for us from a cognitive robotics point of view. And these waveforms are described according to their latency that when they are appearing and their amplitude. So these are some of the common ERPs as you can see here that P's are the positive part of the ERP in the signal and then there are negative parts also. So early part within 100 millisecond you will get you will expect P1 N1s and beyond that you are getting P2 N2 and P3s. So this is what is in the later part that you will be getting into the system. So P1 sensory peak which is elucidated by visual stimulus. P3 depends on task and there are still some debates that what is the exact reason. Some people think that uh, you know it comes because of a specific type of a response particularly error related responses etc. N1 is influenced generally by special attention and N1 is generally obtained from lateral occipital regions. N2 is the error related negativity which is observed when the subject makes an error or the no go. So this is where N2 comes into picture and to some extent P3. So this is what is the ERP or the event related potential. Now what is the advantage of this EEG? Well, first of all, it is a non-contact way of judging the level of the brain. It is also useful during disorders, not just a general brain condition like seizure disorder, head injury, encephalitis, brain tumor, encephalopathy, memory problems and sleep disorders. All these cases, the EEG becomes a very, very useful tool. Also, when someone is in a coma, an EEG may be performed to determine the level of the brain activity. And the test can also be used to monitor activity during brain surgery. So there are many usage of the EEG. What are the precautions? Well, uh, first of all, uh, EEG in very, very rare circumstances can cause seizures in a person who has already a seizure disorder. So that is something that, you know, is uh, generally it is very 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 rare. Now certain factors or conditions that may interfere with the reading of an EEG are low blood sugar, body or eye movement, lights, drinks containing caffeine I already told and oily hair that's why they say do not apply shampoo on the hairs. 
So this is all that we have to keep in our mind for a successful EEG test. So these are the points that we have to keep in our mind for an EEG test which is very important for brain computer interfaces. Thank you.